Okay, this is David Dealer, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. It is great to be back with Professor Rob Phillips. Rob, thanks again for having me over. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you again. All right. As always. Question to start, just administratively, did you have a visiting professorship here before the oh, yeah. official position? Tell me the circumstances, how that came yeah, about, that, what you uh, did. So that was in 1996, and I, was, I think it was called the Clark Milliken yeah. visiting professorship. It was in uh, me mechanics or aero or something like that. It was under the auspices of Michael Ortiz and uh, Eris Rosakis and Ravi, I think, were the ones who kind of pushed it. And you knew Michael from your Brown years. That's right. And yeah. I knew those guys, too, because yeah. they had also been at Brown of course. upon a time. So um, their idea was for me to come out, I think, in January and to spend maybe two terms here. And I taught basically the same course I taught at, at Brown here. And yeah, that at that point, I think that there was some move afoot to possibly hire me and then the feedback I got I mean this is probably not that great to pass along but it was that quote unquote I wasn't ready yet <laughs> <laughs> meaning so, big time like Caltech I, I, yeah I guess that's I take it that's what it meant <laughs> so you know then there was uh, another three and a half years of yeah me being at Brown which is delightful I have absolutely nothing but great things to say about being there uh, where I continued to learn I finished my book um, but yeah, I was a visiting professor here and I thought it was great. You know, I loved being back in California, which is where I'm from. And, you know, my kids went to school, a private school here that maybe doesn't exist anymore. Um, but yeah, now, that was the situation. The, the visiting professorship was exclusively in the, the mechanics part of, That's part right. of your, this is not biology. You're Absolutely not thinking not. about any of that at this point. No. In fact, I would say... Aside from having read the biography of Max Delbruck, at that point, probably biology was not a very big thing for me. I was aware, you know, we had, we would have speakers. Uh, for example, Lorna Gibson, who's at MIT, would come to, Cal to Brown and give talks and seminars about bone mechanics and things like that. It was clear that there would be very interesting things to consider. But it wasn't really until, let's say, 1999 that it all started to really become clear for me. Yeah, so you didn't really have interaction with biology professors during the visiting Zero. professorship. Zero. The fact that David Baltimore, eminent biologist, was president, that didn't really no, register. didn't register at all. Yeah, at all. There was zero, I didn't know anybody in the biology division at all, not a single person. And they weren't even a blip on my radar screen and I wasn't one on theirs either. But you were here long enough to know that this was a terrific place. And For that sure. An opportunity I mean, that, yeah, available. that that part was obvious, you know, and it was it was definitely a sense of coming home. So then you mentioned 1999. What happens in 1999? Yeah, I mean, I'm in the final stages of finishing my book, Crystals, Defects, and Microstructures. We were running a search at Brown, and one of the candidates that really rose to the top there and got hired was a guy named Tom Powers. He came from UPenn working with a guy named Phil Nelson, and Phil was working on a book uh, called Biological Physics, here it is. Uh -huh. And he's, I, I wrote him and I said, you know, I would love to read the draft version of this thing. This is when I was uh, getting ready to go on sabbatical. And I read every single page of it, did every single calculation, sent him all sorts of comments. And he has, in the meantime, done the same for me more than once, actually, on my books. And we've became really great friends. So. Basically, those two things happened. So we hired Tom Powers. I really got to see that there was a lot of excitement, and then the you hired Tom Powers in your in your department at, at Brown. Uh, yes. So was that sort of intellectually very important in terms of the crossover appeal of what biology can bring to? Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, and I think I told you before that I was very impressed with the way that Brown did hiring. Yeah. That the, the division of engineering solid mechanics group was always very liberal in their interpretation of mechanics. They were very forward looking. They were always, I would say, ahead of the game. Yeah. You know, and you know, not to be snide or anything, but I think that in general, Caltech is not in that mode. I'm uh -huh. sorry to say. Uh -huh. You know, I think that Cal that Brown was way more adventurous about, okay, you know, this thing looks like it's gonna be an interesting thing. Not because it's a fad, you know, not because it's the thing everybody's doing, but it, au contraire, because it just seems interesting. Um, 
So yeah, hiring Tom, I think, was big. We were one of the first solid mechanics groups to make such a move, and then many followed, and lots of people follow Brown. You know, has tell been my about, experience. Tell me about Tom's trajectory. How did he get to where? Yeah, to, to writing so that his. Book? Uh, you mean Phil Nelson? So oh, Phil, sorry, Phil Nelson. Phil Nelson. Phil Nelson. Yeah, uh, Tom was his grad student. Right. So, um, Phil, is, he refers to himself as a recovering string theorist. <laughs> so he was at Harvard. He was a, a fellow at Harvard. You know, super, super heavy duty theorist. Princeton undergrad in physics, Harvard, uh, I think grad school, and then also Harvard Fellow, and doing string theory, and then he got hired at UPenn, and when he was there, he met people like Tom Lubensky, and he started shifting, and then became, you know, a super serious player, and, and, and became a great friend of mine, Yeah, you know, somebody that supported me from day one, and that I've learned so much from, and we've written some papers together as well. Now, to contrast, you know, this idea that institutionally Caltech is not as adventurous as Brown in their hiring decisions and yeah. their expansiveness of yeah. fields. How do you how do you square the circle with Richard Murray and you being his first hire yeah. when you were about mm -hmm. to jump in the yeah, deep well, end so of the pool? Yeah, so maybe that's that renders what I said a bit unfair, you know. Um, or maybe it just speaks to just how unique Richard is in yeah. terms of no, and in, also and in, his in, first hire. That is really adventurous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very adventurous, and he. He basically took me at face value when I said I was going to change fields. You know, yeah. that I did not intend to keep going down this path that I had been on, and and he took me seriously. I think he really believed that and and was supportive of that. So the circumstances of yeah, your... I don't want to. I mean, I'm, it, my intent is not to criticize Caltech at all. It's just I, it's just to say that you know maybe it's also a statement about size. You know, Brown the group is like ten or eleven people and. They just had a culture of working together. You know, our divisions are much bigger, and yeah. you know, there's a lot of competing views. So the circumstances of your hire here, were you hired on the basis that you would be a mechanics guy? Yeah. And then in your conversations, you said, if I'm coming here, I'm doing biology? Yeah. Or had you already sort of adopted the mantle of I'm doing biology, and if you hire me, and I think that's it was, how it's going to be? Well, I don't know. I think it's probably more the latter. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, you'd have to ask people like Michael Ortiz and Ravi what they think and Richard, but... My, so well, just to continue the, the story, um, I was getting ready for my sabbatical. I learned about this experiment done at UC Berkeley by Carlos Bustamante and Doug Smith in which they grabbed onto a viral genome and measured the force that builds up when the genome is pushed inside of the viral capsid. That was the end for me. When I learned that you could do mechanics, like there's a machines in Firestone building called in, Instron machines, and they're giant loading devices. And when I learned that you could use a one micron bead and put it in a microscope and essentially reproduce an Instron machine, um, I just was blown away. I just thought, yeah, this is what I need to do is I need to do mechanics at the microscopic scale as it pertains to biology. So that was the limited vision at the time that I got hired here. And the way that, it, you know, my version, which might have some element of sarcasm to it, is that, you know, I was going on my sabbatical in 2000 and um, UC Santa Barbara, um, recruited me. I didn't apply there, but they recruited me and they made me an offer. And Caltech asked me to come yet again because I had been and given a lot of talks, you know, at that point. And this was a week before we were leaving for France for a year to that place. And I came out and, you know, I gave a talk and I, uh, I just almost laughed. You know, I just said, you know, you guys have been flirting with me for four years and it's hard to take this very seriously at this point. And you know, they had me meet with people in applied physics, like Carrie Valhalla and Steve Quake. Um, and I met with Niles Pierce, uh, which was really interesting. You know, that was Richard basically saying, look, here's a, a guy that started out as a mathematician or applied mathematician and shifted to biology in his postdoc with Steve Mayo. And, um, and oddly, you know, to my great surprise, when we got to Lons en Vercors, which is where we were living, you know, Richard got in touch with me. We went through several months of negotiations. And in December of that year, while I was on sabbatical, I left Brown and started my job here. You know, I started my job while living in France and did not come here for another nine months. And were the negotiations about how to build up a lab when yeah, you were entering so that, among fields? other things. So that was one of the things that Richard and I did. As I said, you know, I really thought that unlike the maturity of mechanics or physics, that people that were doing theory and biology were not going to get the attention of experimental biologists to quote unquote test what, whatever it is that they're thinking about. And I kind of had a hunch that we would need to test our own thinking 
And indeed, that was right. You know, like that's still true to this day, I would say. So, yeah, we negotiated space. We negotiated some startup, which was, you know, now in retrospect, how silly I was not really knowing what it would take to start a lab or, or anything like that. And um, I started out in Thomas Building and then I moved to Steel. I took over John Crocker. I forgot his name, Crocker's Lab. Uh, and then I moved into this building in 2005. So I had like a five year period of kind of getting up to speed experimentally where we didn't write any papers for a couple of years also, which was, you know, exciting. Cause I, I really turned my back on my former life. I might've told you that yeah. I did not, I did not pursue renewing my grants. I said no to invited talks. I really was through. I felt like I needed to go all the way. What did you take with you, at least intellectually, as you're posing the new research agenda, as you're building yeah. the lab? What is your prior experience informing yeah. what you want to do? Yeah, and there I have to say that in some ways, that's entirely seamless. Uh -huh. There was no change. There was no change from postdoc to Brown to, to Caltech. You know, already as a postdoc, I think I mentioned to you that I was, I was giving talks with titles like, I, the first one was, Where Are the Atoms? And the next one was, Are There Atoms? <laughs> you're right. You know, yeah. and I was already on this mission of what are the right degrees of freedom? What is, if you're going to do a theory about the world, what are the right degrees of freedom? Mm -hmm. And how do you not sort of fall prey to the dictum of the short story of Borges, which is not construct a map the size of the empire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like for theoretical science, that is the goal. How do you make a map of the natural world that's not as big as the natural world? Mm -hmm. That's the goal. So that was absolute continuity. And truthfully, you know, when we're working on DNA packing, and you know, there's some evidence that backs this up. You know, as soon as Michael Ortiz found out about it, he and his former student and my dear friend Bill Klug, and that's gonna we're gonna have a sad moment talking about him. Um, they basically wrote a really interesting field theory paper. So I had done sort of discrete DNA molecules packing with this guy Prashant who came from Kaushik Bhattacharya and, um, and my friend Yane. And those guys wrote a field theory of the DNA packing. The reason I said we will have to have a moment of sadness is Bill uh, got his PhD here. He became a professor at UCLA. He did a sabbatical right down the hall here. We went on a surf trip to Indonesia and you might or might not remember, but maybe, I don't know, 10, eight years ago, a grad student went to UCLA and killed his advisor, and that was Bill. Oh, My yeah. dear friend Bill. I wrote his, his obituary, and um, yeah, I still feel really sad about that. But that that's just to say that, you know, um, it was clear that there was really very interesting stuff to do on mechanics. When I was getting hired, I told, um, I, Steve Coonan wanted to talk to me. He was the provost, and I told him I was thinking of writing a book on physical biology, even though I didn't know the difference between a protein and a nucleic acid. And I was going to try and do mechanics in biology. And he said, you know, you, this is while I was living in France. He said, you need to talk to some people at Caltech. And the person you need to talk to is Doug Reese. Doug. So I called Doug and we had this great discussion because he was working on mechanosensitive ion channels, which is something to this day that I remain interested in. And uh, in fact, just two days ago, I was at USC talking to my former postdoc, Christoph, and he and Rod McKinnon are doing beautiful things on these piezo channels, which are how we experience touch, among other things. And so Doug and I had this long chat, and you know he was nothing but generous with me. Yeah. And we wrote a couple of really interesting papers on mechanosensitive channels, which in a way are paradigm changing. You know, this was with Paul Wiggins, and really had a totally new idea about what it means for tension to couple to a protein and how you open up an ion channel in response to mechanics. So what I'm saying is that the DNA packing problem and the mechanosensitive ion channel problem, those were my two first things that I dug my teeth into. Both of them had complete continuity relative to what I had been doing at Brown, except instead of thinking about aluminum and deformation of aluminum, I was thinking about lipid bilayers and proteins. But in both cases, the question was, how does force get transmitted it to objects and what happens when force is transmitted to objects that was really what the topic was is this you know just at a deeper level part of a realization that it's all science yes and in fact it's so funny you mentioned that because i'm teaching by one this term and on the first day i told them i said i'm going to rename this course i'm i welcome to nature one you know like i don't we're not going to do this thing like these names of these fields are 
they're a human-made construct. And I'm going to talk about the natural world that we see out the window, and that's nature. And we're trying to understand nature. So welcome to Nature One. That's yeah. what my course is yeah. called. And even more than that, it's nature one that encompasses living and non-living that's right. materials. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, in the 1800s, this guy Mendeleev found a great way to see simplicity in the different materials of this universe, you know, like there are elements yeah, and you can take those elements and you can do stuff with them. And one of the things you can do with them is make amazing materials like of the modern airliner. But another way weirder to my mind, way more provocative thing you can do with them is you and me. And I still kind of marvel in a way at why physics as a field hasn't been more aggressive in saying, yeah, sure, you know, high magnetic fields, low temperatures, that's cool. But come on, you know, like we're walking around. <laughs> that's Those are the elements of the periodic table. Yeah. Walking around. Yep. You're sitting in my office, you know. With consciousness. Consciousness. Then. Yeah. <laughs> these two problems that you mentioned. Yes. Of all the things to work on, why these two? What is the, what's the bigger story there? Well, you know, the Doug, is, I would say there's a lot of accident, but the Doug connection just seemed great. I really liked him. And I thought the problems were amazing. And there was, a, in both cases, there was a killer experiment. So the killer experiment on the viral packing thing was the Bustamante experiment. They calculated how much force builds up as the genome is pushed into the capsid. And they measured a force in piconewtons. And I wanted to calculate the force displacement curve. For the mechanosensitive ion channel case, this guy Eduardo Perozo and Sergei Sukarev and Boris Martinak, they did, uh, and others uh, who I'm forgetting, they put the channel in different in different lipids. The lipids have different thicknesses. In other words, the, the membrane has a different thickness. And what they found is that the gating tension, how much force you have to apply to get the channel to open up, depended on the thickness of the bilayer. That's a smoking gun that somehow the surrounding medium is not an, a passive bystander. So both of them, there was a killer experiment which was calling for theory to be done. And so we did theory. That's what our first papers were. And then the theories made predictions. And so that led to a 10 year effort in experimental science where now the paradigm is very different from the standard biological paradigm. We're doing what I always refer to as figure one theory. I wrote a paper on this that, that you know a lot of people I think resonate with. When I say figure one versus figure seven theory, I think often in biology, figure seven theory is the way things play out. What does that mean? People spend five years doing their experiments. At the end of their paper, they put a model, mm -hmm. and that's their theory. Figure one theory is where the theory is ahead of the experiments, and you design the experiments because you have a prediction you want to test. And that's what happened both for the mechanosensitive ion channel and for the viral DNA packing and for DNA looping and many of the other things that we've done is that we thought we knew what we were talking about. We were willing to make dangerous predictions. You know, I always imagine, you know, like you put your head on the chopping block and you're like, I think such and such is right. And here's how it will scale with salt concentration, genome length, lipid bilayer thickness, whatever, you know, like we think we know. So in physics, there's a very clear demarcation between experimentalists and theorists. That's true. Biology, it's a little muddier than that. It's, yeah. A lot of biologists don't even think about theory That's right. or the value of theorists for their work. Agreed. Given your background, yeah. what advantages did you just see in terms of you know, making a mark in the field, adding value yeah. with a perspective that might not have been there. Yeah. I have to say, you know, this is going to sound, maybe it'll sound like false modesty or something, but I truly believe that, you know, it's not like we've made some mark on the field necessarily, but stylistically, for the long run, I just believe in this approach to discovery. You yeah. know, in other words, do I want to denigrate the, the great achievements of the subject of biology? Absolutely not. But on the other hand, if you can't measure a one in 10 to the sixth thing, you don't get to discover exoplanets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I feel, the fe I feel that the field of biology needs to demand more of itself. And part of that means, you know, like nowadays, we in my lab make curves, and I always make the joke. We could change the labels on the x-axis, and I can trick condensed matter physicists to think that I'm looking at current voltage or, you know, something like that. That's pretty damn good that that's the state of the art. And you know that's in a way how I feel about sort of my career since I've been at Caltech is, and there's a little bit of annoyance with it, which is 
people keep moving the goalposts. They, I, they keep saying, you know, you can't make predictions. And every time we do and they work, they're like, yeah, but that's not the real system or that's not a eukaryote or that's not a multicellular organism or that's not a this or that's not a that. And, and my view is, um, you know, this is what it takes to really, really know and understand stuff deeply. And so, you know, I put a high value on rigor, maybe. And I think, you know, the response often in biology is that um, we're dotting I's and crossing T's. You know, and I'll, I'll live with that. You know, like each of us makes bets. And my bet is that in 50 years, when physics and biology are taught, lots of times they will look more like what we're doing in my lab than they do in some more qualitative old school ways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a, that's a bet. I don't know. I don't know. It's a stylistic mark, as you were saying. Yeah, it's a stylistic mark. And, you know, as far as, um, you know, again, in terms of impact or whatever, I, I, I feel rather pessimistic about that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I guess the little contribution that maybe one could say that we've made is to try to share some enthusiasm for the natural world with, with students, you know, both undergrads and grad students. And when I do my boot camps, you know, faculty members that come from elsewhere or postdocs, you know, just somehow to be resonant with our curiosity and a sense of wonder, and then also a sense of wonder at the power of the human mind, you know. Like this week, I'm gonna give a homework in freshman biology where they're gonna use potassium argon dating to figure out how old Lucy is, the fossil, and also how old the Galapagos tortoises are. The reason this is interesting is that, you know, you probably, all of us know about radioactive dating, but do you actually know, given a rock, and you measure potassium and argon, what formula to use yeah. to figure out the age. And what I'm excited about is like, and I, I do this in the evolution class too, I'm excited to let the students see for themselves the power they have in their minds. They're gonna write down differential equations, they're gonna integrate them, and they're gonna get a formula. And the formula is gonna be of the form, you know, time, or age of the rock is gonna be equal to one over a decay constant, which is like the half-life or rate constant, and then a logarithm of a one plus, you know, number of argons over number of potassiums or, or vice versa, I don't remember. But, you know, that, that's, that superpower kind of shocks me that just the human mind, just by sitting and thinking, <laughs> could come up with such a crazy thing, which is, you tell me how many argon and, and uh, potassium nuclei you've got in that rock, and I'll tell you how old it is. You know? It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And that's what I feel, you know, like you talk about contribution or whatever. Again, I, I have a pretty pessimistic view of that. But in the classroom, you know, there'll be some small number of students that might have that little moment of, wow, you know, I just sat there by myself. Like we were talking about Aratus Thanus. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I sat there by myself and I dreamed. How would I figure out the age of that rock? You know, we talked about Claire Patterson. You know, it's just in his case, the ratio was uranium and lead. It's the same basic idea. So, Tell yeah. me about building up the lab. First of all, what instrumentation do you know to ask for? How do you I figure that out? I didn't. And so we didn't buy anything in the immediate short run at all, really. I mean, my scheme always is to teach things. And so with Steve Quake, um, I started teaching everything that I possibly could. I started flirting with these little versions of boot camps. Uh, I did ME, maybe it was Mechanical Engineering 96, or I don't remember, but a lab class. You know, I scraped together some AFM from somewhere. I got a microscope. That was something probably that Richard helped me out with. And we used our own lab microscope in teaching. And that was something I did all the time in the early years of my lab, and we still do, which is we use our own equipment for the purposes of teaching. So I had a Nikon, which we still have. I can even go show it to you. And, you know, we figured out how to make uh, vesicles, in other words, spheres of lipid bilayer that are fluorescently labeled, and look at them in a microscope. We figured out how to label DNA. And I would say, you know, for 10 years, we sat around and tried to learn how to do things. And that was the power of some amazing people like Paul Grayson and Lynn Hahn and Paul Wiggins and Hernan Garcia and Tristan Ursell, like the early generation, Froso. All of them were game to join a lab where, you know, I didn't know what was going on and to do the adventure. 
I was going to ask you about attracting graduate students and postdocs, and if that yeah. was at least dicey in the beginning. But it well, sounds like it wasn't. It wasn't particularly dicey, and I don't, you know, I generally don't have postdocs, and I didn't during that era. There were no postdocs that came and were really the, sort of the dominant force. It was really the grad students. And if you look at the publications, you'll see, you know, like if we take, let's just take Paul Grayson, you know, he was one of the early ones on the phage stuff. Mm -hmm. So he figured out how to do single molecule experiments, looking at DNA being shot out of viruses. And, you know, it's an amazing thing in the sense that I became friends with Seymour Benzer. You might remember that in the early days he worked on phage. He came to my lab um, down, downstairs here and we showed him DNA being shot out of phage lambda fluorescently. And he literally said, oh my God, you know, it was just like, what a, what a moment for us. You know, like we figured out how to do this experiment. And, and you blew Seymour Benzer's mind. Yeah, and we blew Seymour's <laughs> mind, you know, and, uh, and that's a good thing. What was Seymour like? He was the best. I yeah. mean, I don't know if you ever read Time, Love, Memory, but, yeah. you know, I've read that three or four times. Um, and I may, might have told you John Wiener's son was in my lab. Did I tell you that? Uh, the author. The, the reason that's just, I've got a very weird personal connection. So John's dad was Jerry Wiener, who was, I was has, hired to replace at Brown. Jerry um, had a grandson who was John's son, and um, I think his name was Aaron, who was thinking of n not going to college or dropping out of college. So John Wiener called me up, and he's like, you know. Just the man to talk to. Just the man to talk to. So I said, hey, so let's have him come hang out in the lab. So he came for maybe six months or something. Um, but at any rate, so Seymour was a wonderful, I think, you know, maybe the most impressive person I've known since I've been here. Um, I loved his spirit. You know, he had a sense of wonder. I don't know if you know the story about when Sarkis gave his uh, job talk. But when Seymour died, they read a letter, an email that Seymour sent to Sarkis the day after. So... Uh, Seymour was so excited that when he went poop the next morning, he grabbed it and put it on the microscope because he was so excited about this notion of the microbiome. And I just felt like, you know, every time I talked to him, I was engaging with a mind that was not focused on the careerism stuff, but that was focused on the joy of discovery, the curiosity about what the world's like and that kind of stuff. Yeah, he was a really, really great guy. Now, not really? having postdocs, is there a, a grand theory there for you? Well, I don't know if it's a theory, but I just like working on stuff where I don't know the answer and where we have six years to let things unfold. So a postdoc appointment of two or three years is just too short a time It's too short there. and it's too, too much responsibility in the sense that, you know, they, they want and need to get jobs appropriately. And that kind of means hitting the ground running. And for me, I feel like, you know, I've got a bunch of new grad students right now and in all their cases, you know, you see kind of the amorphous emergence of their own, their own vision. And so I have had, I've had several postdocs and they've been amazing. You know, like two of, two of our most interesting experimental papers were done with this guy, Rob Brewster and another postdoc, uh, Franz Weinert, you know, super proud of them, but they were here a long time. You know, they were here like grad students. They might have had longer times here than they did in grad school. So the deal is, if you're a postdoc to work with you, expect to be here for a while. Well, but I think that's true in most postdocs in biology's cases. It's a long, it's a long thing, yeah. unlike physics. Yeah. But in general, it's not my, it's not my thing. I like right now. I don't have any postdocs really. I mean, I share one with Diane Newman, but Avi, who you know. Yeah. So. Did you have a feeling, at some point? You know, it wasn't risk in terms of tenure, obviously, but no. risk just in terms of new institution, new field, new lab. Do you have a feeling of like, oh my God, this is working, it's clicking? Is there like a singular moment where that happens? Is it a sort of evolutionary process? I don't know. I just, I feel so much that over and over again, I've had luck. You know, like one of the first things that happened when I came here is I got some Keck funding, which is internal. And then um, the amazing thing that happened to me, stunning, which could not happen now, is that I got the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. I was in the first group that got this thing. It was a new idea from Zerhuni when he was the director, and uh, there were like 12 of us, and it was some insane, it's for five years, uh, roughly 800000 a year. It's a huge amount of money. And I basically asked them right from the get-go, can I bank this on low cost extensions and I ran my lab on it for like eight or nine years. So that is the era 
in which we patiently sort of learned how to do our craft. And it was due to the brilliance, the patience, and the openness of this collection of students. You know, each one had a thing. So Lynn Hahn figured out how to do DNA looping experiments. Paul Grayson figured out how to do um, the DNA packing and ejection things. Tristan herself figured out how to do lipid bilayer mechanics. Aaron Garcia figured out how to do gene regulation, you know. It goes on and on like that. And we would sit in this office and, you know, we would discuss. Just to give you an example, we had a, you know, I'm very proud of certain papers, not because they're referenced by anybody, but because they're, they reflect our learning. So Arnon and James Boddicker and Han Jen Lee and I wrote a paper in Biophys J that basically was nothing more than comparing different ways of measuring gene expression. You could use enzymes, you could use fluorescence, you could count mRNA molecules with using what's called fish. And people are partisan about these things. And I don't want to be partisan. I want to know how to do all of them and I want them all to work. You know, like in other words, if I measure G, little G, uh, you might know this, the classic story about, um, about uh, Niels Bohr with the barometer. Oh yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I love that. So just for the people who don't know it, Please. I'll just say it very quickly, which is, um, you know, they, they ask this guy on a qualifying exam how to figure out the height of the building using a barometer. And he basically says something like, uh, I'd give it to the, the guy who works at the building and ask and tell him I'll give it to you if you tell me how high the building <laughs> is. Or, at any rate, they, you know, it was supposedly at the University of Copenhagen, and, and they said, you know, you're flunking the test. And so he came back, and he said, you know, I would hang it, I would hang it from a rope and measure the period of the pendulum at the top and the bottom, and I would drop it from the top of the building. And, you know, <laughs> he gave all these things showing, of course, a clear command of physics. And he said, but, of but I know that the thing, you know, the question, the answer you expect me to give you is something about, you know, using pressure difference at different heights, but that's stupid. So, um, so I loved the fact that we could just see whether different methods agreed. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time on that kind of thing. Yeah. From those first initial questions, where did you yeah. go from there? Or what did you build on as a result? of? Yeah, that? well, so, you know, the, the thing I would say is that right at that time, always 100% integrated into all of this stuff was teaching. Yeah. And maybe that's why I wasn't freaking out, because I just knew that I could every year go into the classroom and do physical biology of the cell. I could do BE 262, uh, APH 260, 162, which was a lab class. And the beauty of the lab classes, the way that, that Steve Quake and I did them, was they were investigative. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to measure the charge on the electron. It was more like, here's some stuff, and this time we're going to try X, Y, and Z. And we just kept doing that. We kept doing that here, and then we started doing it at the Marine Biological Laboratory. You know, I got er invited very early on to be part of that course. And so teaching and research were just the same thing. And so it was just always, here's a snapshot of where we are today, and we're just going to keep trying because we're confident we trust the process. So this book with Yane Kondev was, you know, what I was working on from 2000 on. Mm -hmm. So it was just constantly, constantly, constantly. The goal was... Every chapter of this book, there needed to be a paper. And so, you know, you can see it's like 22 or something chapters. And we basically met that goal. So what I mean by that is that we were working in a way that to many people looked neurotic. Why? We worked on viruses. We worked on DNA looping. We worked on mechanosensitive channel. We worked on reduced alphabets for, for, um, for protein sequence comparison. We worked on the cytoskeleton. We worked on allosteria. You know, it's like endless sets of things that we were doing that seemed to lack a coherent vision. But the coherent vision was, can we make biology predictive? Mm -hmm. That's what they all shared. So basically what I would say is that over the, let's say until like 2017, those first 17 years here were nothing but a series of case studies in physical biology, always with the intent of demonstrating the figure one theory mentality, the interplay between theory and experiment, the idea that you can do physics on biological systems, and you can, and it works. <laughs> so let's back up. This idea yeah. of the quest to make biology predictive. Yes. The world of, of Max Delbruck's biology, yeah. would he have aimed <clears throat> for that? Would that have been a concept that would have even been available to him? What is... Like, what does yeah. that mean chronologically? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's over it's overly simplified for me to make it sound like we're the first ones on the scene. We're ab obviously not at all. You know, people like John Hotfield, who was also here, you know, they were definitely doing predictive things about hemoglo hemoglobin, for example, and about kinetic proofreading. Um, I would say even all as far, long ago as Luria and Delbrook, you know, that there were pre they had a prediction about what their experiment would look like if evolution took place randomly, you know, in other words, there were just random mutations, as opposed to the presence of an antibiotic or an antiviral or a virus or whatever actually inspires mutation. There was a prediction. And, you know, uh, I think often about the early days of, of neuroscience when people were like Helmholtz, he measured the speed of an action potential. People had some ideas about it being instantaneous, you know, and the moment you make the measurement, you find out that it's finite, that changes the conversation. Similarly, the, the notion of synaptic communication, you know, like there's this whole debate between Golgi and Ramoni e. Cajal about the continuity or lack thereof of neurons and whether or not there's chemical communication. There, you know, there's super interesting things that were done using statistics. How many photons it takes for us to register a vision? That's absolutely cut from the same mold as the kinds of things that we were up to. So I wouldn't want to claim that, that we were at all early, even early comers to that. I just think that it's the systematic nature, maybe, that's the thing that our book tries to illustrate. Are there advances either in instrumentation, technology, or theory that make the, the notion of predictability in biology absolutely. more feasible in absolutely. the early 21st century? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, here, here's an example that I think is a general theme, which is many of the old school methods for doing lots of things measured averages. Like, let's take gene expression. You take a ton of cells and you, you extract enzyme that is the product of some gene, and then you use that enzyme to turn some substrate yellow. That's a bulk measurement. In this day and age, using microscopes or using sequencing, I can get single cell information, and that means I can get noise. And the reason I mention that is that knowing the mean is great, but knowing the statistics around the mean mm. is totally different. And when mm. you know that, it's a, it's a window on the mechanism. So I wonder if you can explain why, why is it totally different? What does that yeah. mean? Because there are many ways to get the same mean. Uh -huh. But the shape of the distribution is a lot more mechanistically dependent. And so, you know, like if I were to talk to you about um, the length of filaments inside of cells, they have a cytoskeleton. So you could compute the distribution of length and you can also measure it. And, if, and what I mean is like you get a histogram. In other words, if I make a plot, I'm making a plot on the board, so you know, on this axis is length, and then on this axis is the frequency of the observation. You know, there's some histogram, you know, like that. And so the theory of the histogram is interesting. Let, let's take a classic example. Um, you're the Prussian army, and you have a bunch of units, and then you find out that a certain number of soldiers are killed by getting kicked by horses. And there's more in this unit than that unit. Is it the fault of the commander? So what we can do is we can actually have a null hypothesis. And here's my null hypothesis. It has nothing to do with the commanders. Sometimes life's unfair. There's a classic example of this, which is the number of times a given neighborhood in London was hit during World War II by mm -hmm. V2s. Mm -hmm. And people thought, oh, my, they were aiming at my neighborhood. But if you do the calculation with the Poisson distribution, you find, nope, just bad luck. You know. So using distributions as a window onto mechanism is incredibly powerful. Mm. So I'll give you an, another example that I love. This is an experiment that was done by Dave Savage, who's at Berkeley. Cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, they have four thingies called uh, carboxysomes, which have rubisco in them, which is the thing that fixes carbon from the atmosphere. And when the cell divides, you could have a hypothesis that every one of those things flips a coin. And I mean, sometimes you get two and two in the two daughters. Sometimes you get four and zero. Sometimes you get three and one. So they measured the statistics, and what they found is it's almost always two and two. And what that tells you, it's not a coin flip. Mm -hmm. Then they figured out which gene is the thing that segregates it. They break it, and now it becomes binomial. It becomes a coin flip. So there's tons of examples like that, where knowing the distribution tells you, uh, I, I know something about the mechanism. And indeed, that was the trick of Loria and Delbrook. And this realization then makes what possible? It makes it, it makes it so that we can say we understand things better, you know, <laughs> like it means that we made progress. Yeah. 
you know, like we made progress. We predicted when that, that next eclipse is going to be. Like, you know, I, 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 next time Caltech sends a mail that says they're going to put out telescopes, like there was a transit of Venus, if I remember correctly, um, some years ago. I think it was a transit of Venus. They're like, we will be on athletic fields at 204. And you go there and you see the planet arrive and go across the sun. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's what biology can and should be like, at least mm -hmm. in parts. That's what I'm talking about. I want to know, yeah, on December 25th next year, high tide is going to be at such and such time, and it's going to be that many centimeters. That's the kind of science that I, that's the hopes that I hold out for biology. So for you then, life must not be chaotic. No, it's not that. It's just, you know, part of, part of the beauty of people like Maxwell is that they realized that there's a theory of chaos. There's a theory of, of things that are random. And it works amazingly well. It works amazingly well. So it's because something is a random process or there's stochasticity to it does not mean that we're not able to predict it. I mean, you know that from insurance. You know, we know very confidently how many people are going to die on our roads this year, unfortunately. And we don't know who. So that's not part of the theory. So maybe the better word is life might be anarchical. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Because chaos, as you, as you indicate, suggests that there's a fundamentally predictive nature to it. Which yeah. means that it's not anarchic. Yeah, I guess I feel like, you know, the power of evolution is so enormous. And that's the umbrella, in a way, over the processes over time. And I don't think of that as being anarchical. You know, there's selection, there's drift, there's migration, there's mutation. Like, we kind of know what the things are that give rise to the fact that you know, over the last 30 million years, these things that we call baleen whales started to exist. You know, we know something about that. We know how that can happen, I guess. Rob, a few institutional questions. So yes. David Baltimore did not register with you during your visiting professorship. Right. You came in 2000, right in the middle of his presidency. Right. All of the ways that he worked to raise the profile of biology and life sciences and yeah. biotech yeah. on campus during his presidency. Did that open up things for you in a way that might not have been possible if Caltech had a physicist or engineering I don't, I president? Can't, I don't really know the answer to that, but I will say that things like the Keck and more, you know, there were various kinds of internal fundings along the way, which even to this day, I have been privileged to be part of. So that's what I imagine, you know, um, how, you know, how it is that I ended up talking to Kunin. I don't really know. Um, I got to know Baltimore, David himself, much better later because we co-advised two students. Mm -hmm. And we did some hard work together that in the end, I would say, you know, didn't deliver, unfortunately, as much as I hoped that it would have. What was the work? We were trying to look at uh, this protein, uh, called these proteins called the RAG proteins that do recombination to, the way to think of it is super interesting. Um, you might think that there's sort of a, the words that are used by Jeremy Gunnar are genetic imprisonment. In other words, the gen genome is there. How many possible proteins could you make? And at first cut, the answer is not that many. But then you look at our immune system and you say, well, there's this huge complement of antibodies. How do you generate that much diversity? And it turns out that there's this process known as VDJ recombination where gene segments are assembled together and then also mutations are put inside of that. And so we were trying to study at the single molecule level the enzymes that do that process with his former student or postdoc, David Schatz, who's at Yale. It was incredibly enlightening and super fun. Um, we always referred to them as Big David and Little David, because they're both <laughs> David. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they thought that was funny, but I thought it was very funny. Um, and I, I really delighted in that exchange. But the reason I say that it didn't really work out is I was hoping that we were going to have the same kind of success with that that we had earlier had with how DNA gets looped by transcription factors. There we were able to really go all the way using statistical physics and to make predictions and to, you know, the curves we, we could draw the curves before we made the measurements and the data would fall right on them. We had a vision like that. 
And I would say it really wasn't realized largely, especially my recent student, Soichi. He had such a clean vision. And, you know, this is a part of my career that I find fascinating is all the times that we've crashed and burned. And I think that that's a very important thing. I don't know how often other people talk about it that you've interviewed or whatever, but I'm intrigued. You know, you talk about responsibility and fear or whatever. The biggest responsibility, the biggest fear is the students. And so, you know, with Griffin Chure, one of my, my great ones, we worked on something for like three or four years. And we, he kept coming and sitting in his office and I kept telling him, look, we got to draw a line in the sand. And on that date, we got to stop. And he'd come in and he'd say, just, you know, let me try one more time. And finally we bailed, you know, we bailed long after he was in grad school and started over. That was probably the biggest example of that. But Soichi is another, you know, the David Baltimore collaboration. It just fell short. But falling short of the concept of crashing and burning, crashing and burning is, it, that, that makes sense when you're talking about the career prospects of a student, not yeah. the value of the research yeah. to science. Right? I don't There's know. plenty of value in a failed experiment for what it tells you doesn't work. Maybe. But I, I feel like, you know, the papers that we wrote on that stuff will probably not even be a blip, you know, unfortunately. Whether they made an impact on the big or little David, I don't know, but probably not that much of an impact is my guess. So in that sense, I don't think of it as, you know, like, I don't think of it as being something that moved the needle in some sense. I think the people in the field likely were not particularly enlightened, although the vision we had, they would have been, had it all worked out, you know. I think that's just the way it goes. So you arrive the early 2000s, just, you know, sort of broad sweep of biology and yeah. Caltech. Yeah. This is the beginning of Caltech biology's embrace of big science and biotechnology and startup ventures, yeah. all the kinds of things that Lee Hood wanted to do and Caltech wasn't ready for. Mm -hmm. 30 years earlier, right? Where, where do you see sort of from an, a double outsider, new faculty member, new, 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 you know, new scholar in this field, right? What is your sense of, of, of where things were when you joined the faculty? Yeah. Well, first of all, just people were very nice to me. You know, I, I decided to try to have lunch with 70 people and yeah, you know, I would say, let's meet at the Ath or go to Solidang or whatever. And so, you know, I went and sat in Pamela Bjorkman's old office over, I think, in Kirkhoff and sat with Steve Mayo and I obviously I met with Doug Reese and I talked to Mary Kennedy and I talked to Elliot Meyerowitz and you know I went through a very long list of people um, I guess what I would say is that I was definitely deeply impressed by the microfluidics revolution which was really Steve Quakes and Axel Scherer's thing you know I think they did amazing things in that regard and then after that um, I guess my mind got kind of blown both here and elsewhere by the ways in which DNA sequencing could be used that were different than the naive version of, oh, you get the genome. So, you know, that's, a, that's something today, actually, we got a mail that Barbara Wall just got elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences or whatever, and, you know, she really pushed that agenda. Steve Quake also, you know, he was doing single, single molecule DNA sequencing. I remember the very first experiments because it involved my sci senior scientist, Sun Jin Lee, you know, I think they sequenced five bases using fluorescence on a microscope. But, you know, that's the seeds of an idea. Um, you know, I talked to Henry Lester a lot, and that gave me a lot of things to think about in terms of ion channels and what it means to probe the electrical properties of cells. And um, other than that, I don't know. I mean, I feel like in some ways I'm probably not a good person to ask necessarily. Did but you feel like you were doing small science in the Caltech mode? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it didn't take long, I think maybe 2004 or 2005, I already was teaching by one with Pamela Bjorkman. Mm -hmm. So I taught it three or four times with her. And then I went to Stol Ed Stolper and said, you know, I think death by PowerPoint is a dumb way to do freshman biology. You know, I want to do a lab class. And that's when we, he made it so that I could have some funds to do by one X. And we built a lab actually. And that's been a hugely successful course. Tell me what that means, the X there. What is that? Yeah, I don't know. It's like, uh, I think of it as a lot of different ways. I think of it as X for algebra. I think of uh, X for unknown. I think of it X for extra, you know, just like it, it's, it's... It's a choose your own adventure. Yeah, X. yeah. And so the idea of that course was every week we did a different experiment. And the whole idea was um, we were not going to teach the canon. 
We are not going to try to cover the waterfront of biology. We're just going to do cool things. That's it. And I, I still love that model. It's still the model that I think we should go for for the core, you know, writ large. And uh, it was really fun because we recently had a meeting that involved a number of us, including Carver Mead, and it was just cool to hear. At least there are some colleagues that view that. Like, let's not do the canon. Let's get over the canon. Let's instead just do crazy stuff. Interesting stuff. Yeah, so as far as how Caltech felt, I just, that was when we were starting bioengineering, I just felt uh, welcomed, you know, like it was very quick that they absorbed me into the division of biology. It was before it was BBE. And I was just really grateful. You know, like when I got here, I remember saying to Amy, like maybe someday, just maybe, I would even be able to be part of the division of biology. Or an and, and equally weird dream would be to be a part of PMA. And in the end, those are my two homes. You know, I really don't have much of a connection anymore to mechanics or the mechanics group here, which is sad, but, you know, like I really moved. And now I'd say, yeah, I'm in physics and biology. Those are my natural homes. I don't think I could get hired in either, either of them, though. So, you know. 50% of you could. I don't think so. Yeah. It's kind of funny. When the experimentation or when the, the lab reached a level of maturity, when you could start thinking about instruments, you mentioned earlier, yeah. no instruments because right. we don't know what we're doing yet. Yeah. What were the instruments? Yeah. What was the so, cutting edge that was yeah. available? So the here? very first things I think were trying to, to uh, use microscopy in sophisticated ways. And that the beauty of that is when Steve Quake left for Stanford, that his senior scientist, Hunjin Lee, was kind enough to stay behind and stay in my lab. And he's truly an expert in optics. And that began kind of this long-term thing of building our own microscopes. We did that at Woods Hole. We've done it every year in the boot camp here. And it's almost like a rite of passage for people in my group is every year we have like 50 people in our boot camp in the fall. And every one of them builds a microscope with my gang. We have like four setups. And so, you know, if you go downstairs, you'll see that Hun Jin basically over and over again would design an experiment where we, we used custom homemade optics. And, you know, I had students that actually, like Dave Wu, who got into that. And so, you know, we had a paper in PNAS where we pulled on tethers. We had a membrane, we pulled tethers. And, you know, that's very sophisticated. And so there was a lot of that kind of microscopy stuff and um, measurement of gene expression. And then there became the era of like getting into DNA sequencing, you know, flow cytometry and sequencing. So in that sense, I don't think we're particularly cutting edge, but we're kind of cutting edge in the way we use things, the level of rigor and the reproducibility and the error bars. Did things. you see yourself operating exclusively in a basic science environment? Were there any translational or biotech kinds yeah. of interests that you pursued? No, I, th I feel like, you know, you referred to me as being militant uh, with respect to my name, and I, I feel like maybe I am slightly militant about it, but probably inappropriately. I don't know. I mean, I feel life is short, and I just wasn't that interested in the transient nature of a product. And in fact, this has even come up recently in the context of my, you know, very sort of intense relationship with the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and what, what they're trying to do on the 100-year time scale and what constitutes a tool, you know, like what constitutes a real step forward for philanthropy to really be proud of. And, you know, I don't know, there's a dichotomy there, I guess. So the answer is no. I mean, I haven't really thought that much about translation, but not because I'm opposed to it. It's just, I haven't, I don't have any idea. You know, it's not that I have a good idea that I feel like we need to make a patent or Whatever, our so when, when you say life is short, that I mean, just the, your efforts, you just want to discover stuff. You want to be I, curious I, I, and figure above it Above all, out. I want to learn stuff. Yeah, I want to make sense of this world and my life in it and your life in it. You know, even simple things like, you know, I won't, I won't get specific because I, you know, it's, it's your story to tell, but, you know, like how many kids you have and what, it, you know, the way you think about a family and, you know, what does it mean for each of us to live our lives? Like you know, all those questions matter to me and there's only so much time in a day and you know we didn't really talk about it but um you know i ended up uh in the hospital at the end of my time at brown and i was at a seminar and i thought i was having a heart attack and i'm like the skin was tingling my face got all weird and i you know, went to the hospital and you know after a week of tests and stuff 
um, they basically laughed at me because I was telling them, yeah, you know, the only time I, lately I feel like I can breathe is when I'm kicking people's ass in the pool or on a bike. And they're like, you're not that smart because that's not the way heart attacks work. <laughs> <laughs> like, you breathe best when you're exercising hardest. Yeah. Like, you're, you're going through some sort of anxiety. And I'm like, but I'm a super tough guy. Like, what are you talking about? Anxiety. I'm like, I'm not having a panic attack or something. I'm like, yeah, you are. And what I got out of that was a firm belief, a firm belief that all of us have our limits. Every one of us. I don't know anybody that's an exception to that. And therefore, I can't say yes to everything. I don't know. That's like the high level umbrella take on it. And so I've watched a lot of my friends do their entrepreneurial things. And it's cool that they like that. I infinitely would prefer to write books and teach to doing that. I don't want to have to engage with the law. I don't want to have to engage with marketing. I don't have to engage with all the compromise. You know, like I'm not interested in team teaching. I want to just show up and do my thing. It's have selfish. You, have you seen your research take on that life beyond your lab where it does go into applications? Or are your graduate students really self-selected where they want to be, yeah. you know, fundamental researchers like yeah. you? Yeah. I think they're largely self-selected. I don't think it has gone that way, regrettably, although the things I did at Brown, you know, that finite element atomistic stuff, yeah. you know, that's a thing for sure. Yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, like that's in a way a thing I turn my back on. The thing that we're doing right now on genomes, if we succeed, I mean, I think it'll be a game changer, honestly. And people will care about it. But, you know, we're still in the process of seeing whether we can truly pull it off. And, you know, I hope it will make a splash and it will make an impression on people. I don't understand why they aren't more annoyed by the state of the art. And my hope is to, you know, to solve a problem with the state of the art. What's the problem? The problem is that uh, currently we have like 10 to the 17th nucleotides deposited on the NIH databases. I believe that's a factor of like 10,000 more than the number of letters in the Library of Congress. So yeah, it's all this sequence information. And yet, you know, like what, what do you think is the best understood organisms on Earth? Let's choose five. Drosophila. Good. Uh, zebrafish. Fine. Uh, Go smaller. Smaller, let's say an amoeba. Yeah, okay. Like that, I don't know. Ye yeast, E. coli. Oh yeah, of course. C. Of elegans, course. right? And maybe humans. All right. So let's say E. coli is maybe the best understood of all the organisms. I mean, it's the basis of modern molecular biology in the '50s, '60s, whatever. So it has a genome. The genome is 4.5 million base, 4.6 million base pairs long. That means the length of Shakespeare, the complete works of Shakespeare. It has roughly 4,000 genes, and for 60 percent of them, we know nothing about how they're regulated. In other words, okay, let, now let's go to, to humans. You know, you, you have 3 billion base pairs in your genome, 20,000-ish genes, and in general, we do not know how they're regulated. And there was a very exciting moment in the early days of genomics, let's say, when Alan Wilson and Mary Claire King, they wrote a beautiful paper in Science, if I remember correctly, about the contrast between the chimp and the human genome. People were surprised by how similar they were super similar like our hemoglobins are identical so the question was how do we how are we so different and the answer at least a partial answer is because the genes are regulated differently so i'm trying to make a big deal about regulation it's one of it's one of the great discoveries of modern biology in fact monod made this remark about the second secret of life when he discovered the nature of regulation so for e coli for 60 percent of the genes we do not know how they're regulated at all at all Zero. In Drosophila, C. elegans, yeast, it's more than 90%. So I feel like, you know, you're a writer. It'd be like writing in a language for which you know nothing about the rules of grammar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be gibberish. And it is gibberish in the sense that, you know, if I pick an arbitrary gene in E. coli or yeast or whatever, and I tell you, I want to know how that gene reacts to the world. How does that gene, how does it express the fact that it cares about what's going on in the world? The answer is, we don't know. 
and we don't know squared because not only do we not know how the gene is regulated, but we also don't know how small molecules, signals, talk to it. It's like a double ignorance. And so to me, that's one of the great unsolved mysteries of modern science. And I, I'm in shock that more people aren't bugged about it. You know, like we hear this whole enterprise of synthetic biology. What does that mean? It means you take a parts list and you build things like Legos with the parts. I'm trying to tell you that we know that there's all these parts. There must be all these parts. We don't know what, anything about them. We just know that they must be there. We Theoretically, we don't even know what they are or where we, they yeah. are. Yeah, I mean, we might know, you know, like I think we know in the E. coli genome that there are some in excess of 200 transcription factors, perhaps. Um, probably people know that better than the way I just said it. I don't remember the details. But, you know, how, how a large fraction of genes are regulated, we don't know. We just simply don't know. So this double ignorance, what were the advances? You know, the Socratic idea, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yeah. Right? What were some of the advances that opened up this window to yeah. real, realizing how little... Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say two things. So there's the whole, sort of modern history of molecular biology, which, you know, there's various versions of this. You probably heard the, like, Beetle and Tatum. Um, the, way, the, the way you might say it is, you know, one gene, one thesis. <laughs> so during the okay. 60s and 70s and 80s or whatever, people were doing incredibly hard work to figure out how gene X works. That's how it worked. You know, like people would take multiple theses to figure out how the gal operon worked or the lac operon worked or the arabinose operon. You know, the arabinose operon was something that Bob Schleif at Hopkins worked on, you know, over his whole career. And he really dissected it. And graduate student after graduate student after graduate student did that. Well, okay. Then arrives the sequencing era. Now we got the whole E. coli genome. Now we realize, okay, we know where there's 4,000 genes. We know where the starts are. We realize, oh, wouldn't it be nice for that gene X that we don't know anything about if we had the same state of knowledge as we do about lactose, arabinose, galactose, whatever, you know? So that's the path in a way that we're on right now, which is to go from complete ignorance to statistical physics predictions of a whole genome at once. And I hope, you know, in a year or two, I'll be able to tell you we're done with E. coli. And done doesn't mean like a, a bunch of cute figures. It means a website that has what we call energy matrices so that anybody can basically design the genome. That's the goal, you know, like all the way from ignorance to, to, to the finish line. And Victoria Orphan and I kind of formulated a, a project, which we call the Alvin Challenge, which is she goes down into the seafloor sediment on the submersible Alvin, grab some organism that's never been seen before and a week later we have the whole thing solved in the sense that we know how to do statistical physics on every single gene how they're wired together you might remember that eric davidson was famous for these diagrams of the wiring mm -hmm. of the genes in the specification of the body plan of the sea urchin that's what in a way what we need but even that's insufficient that's kind of a linkage diagram that shows how different genes talk to each other but that's a very special piece that's picked. And the, the point is, there's a whole spectrum of those things for every organism. And as we just were saying, there's a concentration. Like, that's not present. How many copies of all those molecules are present? That matters. And then who talks to them? Mm -hmm. What are the small molecules that talk to all of those transcription factors mm -hmm. that dictate when things are on and off? Like, when you and I drink milk, genes are turned on to digest lactose. Until then, they're waiting for the signal, which is like, hey, there's some lactose sugar around, dude. You better turn on the genes so that you can handle that and clip it and make use of it. So, yeah. We talked about the seamless intellectual transition psychologically or even yeah. intellectually, you know, from Brown to Caltech. Yeah. We haven't talked yet really about computation, how you interface with computers yeah. in your mechanics life and now in your biology life. Yeah. So... Um, so I think there was a lot of intention there in the sense that, you know, my life at Brown was super computational. Yeah. In other words, the thing that we did, this quasi-continuum method that we did with Ortiz, it's intrinsically computational. It's not, I mean, there's pieces of it that you can do on a blackboard, but in general, it's, it, it only exists as a computational notion. And in a way, my reaction to a statement you made earlier when I got here was, 
uh, your statement was about the role of theory in biology. Mm -hmm. And I really despised this idea that theory in biology means computation. You know, there's this field right. called computational biology. Right. So I felt almost an obligation to exaggerate in the form of pencil and paper theory to the exclusion of computation because I so wanted to say, I'm sorry, computation is a tool. You don't have a wrench mechanic. You have a mechanic who uses wrenches to fix things, but they also, she or she uses screwdrivers and whatever else, you know, like the computer is a tool. And so I would say in the early days, we were really fixated on pencil and paper type theory. Over time, it just seems in a way kind of silly to not embrace the reality of the fact that we have this tool that allows us to do things that are absolutely unimaginable in the absence of a computer. You know, and the, way, the, the example that I always think of as being most simple and transparent is I'm impatient. I go to LAX, I might have a mask on, I go to clear, I always have my phone, they take a picture of my irises like Tom Cruise in some Mission Impossible movie, and as soon as the picture is taken, I always take my phone and I slap it down on the scanner and I go, Robert Brooks Phillips Jr. Machine Learning, boom, there's my, there's my name, you know, like my irises, it's like out of Mission Impossible. What do I take away from that, you know, or beating the world champion at Go? What I take away from that is like, I'm an idiot if I'm gonna not embrace the fact that we have these tools that allow us to do things that the human mind by itself cannot do. So, you know, I guess I would say once again, you know, everything for me always passes through teaching. I wanna try to inspire the next generation of students, not by letting them use black box machine learning stuff, but by having them understand what it is and write their own. So, you know, that's what's going to happen in by one this term. They'll write their own machine learning little, little teeny tiny version of a machine learning thing just to get a feel for it. To clarify, you're saying that computers are a tool that they make things possible. What, what do they make more efficient yeah. that could be done? Just it's more efficient to do them with computers. And what literally could not be done yeah. absent computers? Yeah. It's getting, I feel like it's getting harder and harder to say that things could be done by hand. You know, like some of our early experiments, you didn't really need a computer. Um, Just because the data sets were small enough? Yeah, like if we're measuring enzyme action, you know, we can, we actually get a readout on a spectrophotometer or something like that and we can plot points. But by the time we're doing experiments using this method called FISH and we're looking at 10,000 cells, you're not gonna do the image analysis by hand. Yeah. It's just simply not possible. You know, one of the things that's always been interesting to me and my NIH Pioneer Award proposal was called a terabyte too far. Mm. And I, in the proposal, I calculated how many terabytes of data are, were in the, what was then called the Millikan Library. And it's like two. And what I said is that in my lab, we can generate a terabyte of data in a day. And that makes me feel like we all need to take a good hard look in the mirror and feel a little uh, sober about that because you know, in a way, the two terabytes of a library is all of human knowledge. And then in one day's use with a camera on a microscope, I can generate terabytes worth of data or something like that. And it just, it just leaves me feeling cold. Like we have a responsibility to try to tame that data and figure out what it means. So anyway, to answer your question, image analysis, sequence analysis, you know, like the thing we're doing now to try to dissect regulatory genomes, that's hopeless. We're, we're, we're generating, you know, truly millions of sequences millions and so absent the computer forget it it's not even possible this this leaving you cold what's the yeah. responsibility there that we shouldn't create data for the sake of creating data that we should be intentional with these experiments i don't i you know anything that involves everybody agreeing to anything i'm not in favor of no i'm saying for so, your own philosophy but for my for my own philosophy my own subjective thing i just feel you know at the end of the day the easiest uh, criterion for me to use is what am I going to tell those brilliant 18 year olds? Yeah. So, you know, I don't think we talked about it, but you, you know the story about the young Einstein at ETH and how unhappy he was? Yeah. And they didn't teach Maxwell's equations. That's 30 years after Maxwell. It'd be like in 1950 not teaching quantum mechanics. It makes no sense at all. I always think about that. What am I not doing 
for a bunch of, you know, the, those 18 year olds in 10, 100 that I'm teaching, some of them are going to end up being the movers and shakers of tomorrow, right? Do you yeah, agree with that? Absolutely. So it's pretty arrogant for me to think of them as a bunch of 18 year olds. I need to project them 25 years forward. Yeah. And what am I, what did I neglect to tell them? Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like, um, I, when I think about data, I always tell them the quote from Poincaré. So science is built up of facts as a house is built up of bricks, but a mere accumulation of facts is no more a science than a pile of bricks is a house. Mm -hmm. I reject, you know, we're each entitled to our worldviews. I reject the idea that finding correlations in data is a satisfactory version of modern science. I just, you know, and maybe I'll be dismissed as old or whatever, but that's the way it's gonna be for me. I feel like the, the, it's back to the Borges story. Our goal here is to be able to make a map of the empire that's not the size of the empire. That's my job description. And so, you know, when we, to me, it's super exciting, the Barbara Wald success, you know? You get a transcriptome. That means you measure the mRNAs that are present in a bunch of cells. And maybe it's a long developmental pathway. What is that data set? It's a series of 20,000 dimensional vectors. Why is it a 20,000 dimensional vector? Because every gene has a count. There's 20,000 genes. So I have a vector, which is this cell's current state of how many copies of each mRNA there are. And then I have another cell. And then, I, and then maybe I have a time evolution. And the question is, is are we going to be satisfied with 20,000 dimensional vectors? Is that the best we've got? I say no. No way. Because of the tools we have? Because of no, our because of No, because of the history of science hmm. the, and the goal of science. The goal of, to my mind, the goals of science are to figure out how to tell stories about the natural world, are to see the unity in things that appear to not be unity. You know, like a pendulum. Galileo sees a swinging chandelier. It's not even, you couldn't even in that year say the words RLC circuit. 200 years later, people are figuring out how to do capacitors and inductors and resistors, and you realize, oh, that's the same as a pendulum. It's the same, literally the same mathematics. Or Thomas Young, and he discovers interference of waves, and then he says, there's something about acoustics, and there's something about the Bay of, um, what's the bay? The, bay, the Gulf of Tonkin, which only has two tides, per day, a high tide and a low tide per day, like mind-blowing weird, and interference of light. Like, they're all the same thing. That's my job. What is the same in biology that people don't yet see as the same? And like there's this beautiful piece of mathematics called graph theory, which is old at this point. You know, it was already started with Euler and the bridges of Konigsberg, the thing that you probably know about. But, you know, graph theory tells is a unifying language that allows me to talk about regulation, food chains, signaling, all in the same way, same mathematics. There are nodes. There are edges that connect the nodes, which are rate constants, and I can work out the time dependence of that thing, and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about, you know, Svalbard and polar bears and Arctic foxes and terns, or I'm talking about gene expression. I can abstract away and say they're nodes on a graph. And that's not the normal thing that you would say about biology, you know what I mean? In other words, if you pick up a big fat book on biology, tone is not going to be, hey, graph theory is like a unifying umbrella over that stuff. And I think there should be more of that. That's, but that's what my job is. Because, because you care about undergraduates so much, I yeah. wonder if you can provide sort of a, like a composite view of a Caltech undergraduate, their interests, their motivations, what got them here, yeah. and what, because of your appreciation of their potential, what they could go on to achieve. Yeah. how that influences the way you interact with them. Yeah. That's a super hard question and I and I feel I feel super disqualified to answer it in a way. Like um their profile is so the opposite of mine. Like you know, we talked about this. What yeah. was I doing when I was 18? <laughs> right. <laughs> I was on a sailboat and then I was on a van trip for 6 months and then I became an electrician and fell through the roof of the La Jolla Mercedes Benz <laughs> dealers um bedroom. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's me at age 24. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to be negative. I, I have to fight kind of hard not to get a little bit carried away with how they got here. You know, it's like, 
a lot of a lot of stamps on their academic passports and a lot of rigor and a lot of taking AP classes and doing really well and you know performing for the man or however you want to put it in fact I told this freshman class on the first day of class I said look we are here because of a sense of wonder we're I don't care if you're valedictorian in fact I have to confess I'm a little suspicious if you're a valedictorian just a little um, I think that they are have been disrespected until now and that's the first thing I always tell them you're ready you're ready the grad students you are ready to make discoveries now you're ready to ask the right questions now even though the authority figures are going to tell you you need to have your PhD blah 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 there's it's true there's a lot of apprenticeship pieces but it doesn't mean you're not ready to be playful I guess that's why I like YouTube also because their youth are free to show us what happens when they just are unencumbered by all the pressure so anyway to answer your question I feel like I'm their biggest fan but I may be their biggest critic too because I'm really angry almost about their obsession with grades and units and being triple majors and you know just like all the stuff that's matters of appearance as opposed to matter of soul um, if that makes any sense so I just really like the the freedom of inquiry that you see when you get them out of the classroom and just being themselves exploring something and I feel that yeah again I think we kind of disrespect them we, they've been disrespected before they got here and we continue to disrespect them which is why I did buy one X it's why I do the evolution course it's why I do the boot camp those are blown up versions of what it means to be in the classroom you know um, did we watch Sehi's video from the Galapagos we did yeah we did. so you know it's like incredible that is what I'm after and I'm still in touch with her you know it's like she's a changed person and that's that's what my view is it's like feel free to discover what you have inside of you in this one and only little teeny tiny life of yours you know nobody tells them that or not many people tell them that most people are telling them about the the progression that they need in order to do the next thing in the progression and not so much about you know how do you take um, you know these these are the these are the notebooks that we hand out to the uh, students in our evolution course these are all mine and you know this is these are just I wonder when we're in the field I mean you, you probably know these notebooks but they're uh, they're geology notebooks so you know you can pour water on them and then you can write you know cool so it's called write in the rain which you see right there right in the rain oh yeah and uh, you know I feel like um, the undergrads need encouragement to ask questions <laughs> to break out of their success tunnel vision mode yeah yeah to get into the right grad school to get the right fellowship to get the right postdoc to get the right job to get the right grant to get the right I mean it's endless right and I don't know I feel like we undervalue uh, creativity or something so what does that look like when you break through when you unlock that that mindset for an undergraduate well, you know it one of the things it looks like is you know one of the students that went with me to both the Galapagos and New Zealand I mean, to Indonesia, uh, she canceled her MD PhD at UCLA. That's what it looks like. <laughs> um, there are others, but I, I, it's not my story to tell. Yeah. There, are, there are a number of people who have made decisions where they decided, okay, I'm going to, I don't know, the Jack London quote that we talked about, you know, I'd rather be ashes than dust, um, but they're going to go for it. They're going to try to be a, you know get off the academic bunny slopes and get on a black diamond you know when you came in the office you asked how my trip was um, so I was just in Colorado with two of my best friends and we were you know we were pretty aggressive they're skiers and I'm a snowboarder I used to be a skier with these guys and one of the days we had the transition from one side of the ski area to the other 
which involved a double black diamond through the trees. And I had the second worst crash of my whole life oh. and had to go to the hospital. And, you know, but at the same time, like the analogy is meaningful to me, you know, like you got to go on the double black diamonds, I think. <laughs> and uh, when you do, sometimes you eat it. So, um, yeah. I think as far as, you know, people in the lab or whatever, I just, I really like to encourage that that sense of this is your one and only chance you know like you know that Eminem song uh, that's an eight mile oh yeah like, yeah you know, that, that's it it's your shot it's your one shot like, you know and it's also in Hamilton that's right you know it's I, I just think you know maybe these things are cliches I feel like a walking cliche in some sense but I guess the only thing I can say is that my actions have largely been aligned with my cliches <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's a good epitaph yeah, <laughs> maybe. Rob, last question or topic for today. You mentioned 2017 as sort of a bookend yeah. of this quest in predictive biology. What was yeah. happening around that point? What yeah, that what mean? happened, I would say, is that that year was a particularly productive year at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Yeah. Um, my, my book, uh, Cell Biology by the Numbers, was done. Um, physical biology of the cell had been out for a while. I kind of had articulated this idea of doing a series, kind of like the Landau and Lifshitz series. That's very arrogant to say it that way, but you know, like representation of deep dive into different pieces of biology. And while I was at Woods Hole, I sort of came back to the problem of my, uh, the scientific problem of my life, the one that I've been most attracted to, which is non equilibrium physics, and basically set up. I would say what amounted to, in the end, probably the sort of strongest collaboration of my life with mm. my book co-author, Christina. And so we wrote, wrote a couple books together and a bunch of papers, but that really transitioned my lab onto non-equilibrium physics of the cytoskeleton, and, and we focused as a lab. I focused much more on only two problems. In other words, I kind of got off the physical biology of the cell, new paper for every chapter, sort of neurotic cover the whole waterfront. I feel like we succeeded, even though I don't know that anybody got that. I got it. Like every single, more or less everything we tried, except for a few massive failures, which were amazing. Like with Diane Newman, we had a massive failure. Um, kind of worked. We were able to do this predictive thing. So we really focused down. Genome, the thing that I told you about a few minutes ago, and active matter and non-equilibrium physics. And then that, you know, what, another new thing spawned off of that, which is this whole human impacts thing. But I would say, you know, I've had, I've had like three or four super meaningful collaborations. Yannick Kondev, who's at Brandeis, that was like a, it's still going on, but like especially potent during 2000 to 2015. We calculated almost every day together. And then Aaron Garcia, with whom I've written, I think three or four books at this point, and then Christina Heeshan. Um, those are the people like I, really sort of had a mind meld with where we worked every day what for might years be, on end. You know, intellectually from a personality front, what might be the commonality between these three collaborators that have been so good for you, for your collaboration? Um, open, I, I think the, the way I put it, I always said it with respect to Yane, is I could call him up tomorrow or today and say, you know, I don't, I don't remember how to solve a linear equation. And he would just, he would just start telling, you know, he would walk me through it. There's no sense whatsoever of trying to worry about sounding smart or dumb. Um, there's a sense of playfulness, a sense of willingness to just engage with any and all questions. So that was true 100% with Yane. It's true, you know, 85% with Ernan and then 100% also with Christina. Um, we just, all the time, just did stuff. How did the collaboration with Christina get started? She was a student in Woods Hole. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we basically decided to write a review article, which then became a book. Uh -huh. And that's the book, The Restless Cell, which is now in copy editing. So it'll be out shortly. And then Aaron and I have been working on this thing called physical genomics from E. coli to elephants. So, um, and Yanni and I, we did physical biology of the cell several times. And then we also have written tons of papers together. I'd say it must be 20 papers. And you know, each one of those comes down to spending the mornings, you know, he's on the East Coast, spending the mornings on Skype or Zoom or on the phone. We agree on notation and we do calculations side by side and then we always teach together. 
So like he and I will teach at EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg in July. It'll be 60 hours, just the two of us. We steal the chalk from each other at the board. It's, it's almost like an act. Um, and we're talking about new things again, you know, like the cost to make gradients. So we've already got sort of this year's teaching creativity things out on the horizon. Yeah. All right, so to set the stage for tomorrow, we can yeah. bring it right up to the present tomorrow. Yeah. Do you see the new focus in 2017 as dramatic as what you had done in 2000 coming to Caltech? No, no. Um, I, I mean, it, it just, it didn't involve as big a shift, I would say. But the f in a way, the thing that maybe makes it a little different is that it feels like of all the things that I've thought about in my whole life, it's really working on the question that more than any other has bugged me. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the reality of what happened in 2017, I suppose, is like truly saying, I'm going to, with open arms, greet the problems that mean the most to me. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to talk about it uh, tomorrow or whenever, in... Um, in October, I went to Israel to meet with Ron Milo, who's another, I should have mentioned him as well. You know, he and I had this amazing adventure together. He, he also belongs on that list. Uh, many years, a decade of, uh, it's just that it wasn't so much calculation as trying to understand the numbers. But when I was there visiting him, we tried to think about our advice to each other about our lives and careers, like what next? And, you know, he, and he brought it up the other day on Zoom, two, two or three days ago. Um, he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I think you should keep going with the teaching and, you know, your active matter stuff is cool and your genome stuff is cool, but the things we're doing on human impacts are so important that I personally, meaning him, think that what you should do is in a way jettison everything and only focus on that. So it might be fun for us to talk. It's a very, very sort of different thread yeah. of things related to biomass on the earth and stuff that emerged out of thinking about the bio numbers yeah. database. Let's pick up on that, human yeah. impacts. Yeah, sounds good. Very good.